In the Sir? Icon booth, yes, show number three, day one. Show number three, day one, Urtech 2019. We are unlocking the unconventional game right here in the Icon booth. Simon from Icon, sir, it's a pleasure to have you. I'm excited about what you're going to tell us at a higher level, but uh, you got to be right up on the microphone for this, right? They've got to be right up on that thing, yeah, like almost on. It's, your, be it's yeah. your best friend. It's, it's your best this friend. Is, it's is your that close enough? Here, here, give us something. Say something. Is that good? Yes, it's yes, perfect, Simon. Perfect. All, right. All right, welcome to the booth, sir. We are going to talk real quick. Let's go into the conception, just kind of the, uh, the beginning of this presentation. How did you become Simon today at Icon, working on what you're working on? What was the career path? What were some major moves along yeah. the way? I'm a geophysicist by training. I've been at Icon about 12 years. Uh, I've been in the service team running projects for oil gas companies around the world. Based in London about four years ago, got the opportunity oh. to come out here to Houston. Um, to lead the team. So nice. A lot of onshore or offshore in those yeah, four years? Yeah, so historically it was a predominantly offshore, our technology. Um, yeah. But coming out to Houston, that was the real, some of the real opportunity to actually see how that technology transfers then okay. uh, to the onshore market. Well, what were some of the offshore basins you worked before you came to Houston? Yeah, so Icon being Icon, that was very much a growth phase. So London did, we were global from London. So North Sea, West Africa, the, the hotspots, but North Africa, Onshore Pakistan, uh, pre silk so carbonates Brazil. If I'm reading the conversation correctly, I would say that you are really on the front lines in the last four years, geophysically, you've been on the front lines of seeing what is possible geophysically in the conventional offshore reservoirs that are perfect to everyone known to man, but are unrealistic because most people can't afford a $100 million <laughs> well. And then now you're on the front lines of the unconventionals onshore, where we have a ton of operators trying to figure this out in the Delaware Basin, the Midland Basin. So you're really on the front lines of seeing what's capable geophysically and what been, has been proven, and now the challenges of the unconventional. Yeah, that's fair. That's Sweet, man. Is that what this presentation is? or? Yes, this is a case study we did with uh, Fairfield Geotechnologies. Uh, Andrew Lewis is sat next to me. Andrew, what's um, up, man? Yeah, what's going on? <laughs> <laughs> and this was really just an opportunity to show how our technology works um, with some of the great seismic data that's available on that data in the Delaware Basin, so Fairfield seismic data out there. And just an opportunity to really show that data off is um, in okay. Fairfield's interest to show what can be achieved with their data. And then yeah. it's also for Icon's perspective showing what that technology can do. Wow. All nice. right, let's see it, man. What let's, let's get what? a deep, Mr. Payne, take us down the rabbit hole, man. Let's yeah. So uh, just to get, run for a few introduction slides, if the pointer the works. Is that cool if I call you that, Mr. Payne? Mr. Do Payne. I generally go by Dr. Payne. Dr. Payne? I like that better. <laughs> I like that better. <laughs> Dr. Uh, Payne. Dr. Payne. All right, the mouse is uh, not working. P-Dog, we're going to hit you like this every time you need to flip this thing. So this is a sort of 23 mile section, Delaware Basin. Um, you're looking at Bone Spring Formation. Where's got the map? Five, five where's, wells there. Where's the map telling me exactly where this line is? Uh, it's top secret. <laughs> it's top secret, okay. <laughs> so uh, we're, we're, are we saying like northwest, northwest shelf into the basin and then back up onto the Central Basin platform or maybe the Diablo platform? Central Basin. Central awesome. Basin plat. Okay, cool. I'm following. Yeah. There's some. So we're, we're Northern Delaware Basin. It's Bone Spring Formation. What you're looking at is five wells there. So you're looking at a volume yeah. of carbonate. Yep. So dark blue is where you get the most carbonate rich stuff. What's important about the carbonates? Why do we care about them? So they're going to be uh, potentially our frack barriers. They're going to, drilling is going to add drilling cost, time, drilling into there. Um, we're also interested. Okay. Those zones, there might potentially be um, something we want to exploit or we want to avoid. The carbonate itself as a target or around the carbonates? It's generally people are generally targeting the more siliciclastic intervals, but potentially you might yeah. be interested. As I say, sometimes the geophysics for the unconventionals is about what not to drill or rather uh, than, what rather to than drill. finding that sweet spot. How does uh, petrophysical modeling how, and geophysically, how can you differentiate a limestone and a dolomite? Is it possible? Yeah, um, so my petrophysics colleagues will surely be, definitely give you uh, some good answers there. Generally, in this part of the Delaware Basin, there is, there is some dolomite, but it's not a huge, huge contribution. 
if we so here's just highlighting the first bone spring sandstone so that's a um, so that's a massive target out in this part of the northern Delaware Basin so a lot of production a lot of landing in that zone um, obviously we call it sandstone but there are carbonates in there and it's the, those carbonates this um, sorry if you go back one that um, carbonate that you can see there with a the, um, the yellow arrow and that, that bottom bone spring C3, that's just the base of the bone spring S? Top of the third bone. Yeah, that's top of the bone. Okay. Oh. okay, I'm following. That doesn't look too much. So okay. you, we've got some orange tops there. That's our first bone spring sandstone. Yeah. It's a big interval for production. Yeah. Um, but in some of those wells, you can see there is a carbonate there. Yeah, so that's going to be a by carbonates. Yeah. That's going to be a um, big factor for us if we drill this, a driller well there. It's going to add time to our drilling therefore cost us money. So also that carbonate is going to be a mechanically hard bed. So um, if we try and complete our fracking, potentially there's going to be a frack barrier in there. Yeah, there is. So we want to know where that carbonate extends. And you yeah. can see the well to the left, it's gone. How well thick, to the right. How thick is the, uh, the interval right there? Can yeah, you give so us a rough, rough estimate? The, the two carbonates there that, with the yellow arrow, the top one's about 10 foot, the lower one's about 20 Whoa. feet. So you sort of look at, and there's a gross interval about 50. Yeah. Okay. So this then is our seismic data. So clearly that's got spatial information from between our wells. So that's going to be useful. The question is, how do we get to geology from that reflectivity? Um, and then this is then showing you a phase shift prediction using our GIFI technology. And oh, interesting. It takes so a bit of right. explanation. But the dark blues, the carbonates. Yeah, so, so break this down, break this down, color right. by color. Yeah. yeah. So dark blues are cleanest carbonates. So hopefully you can see that correlates then with what I'm showing you in the well logs. The light blues are, it's a sort of calcareous mudstone, so that's quite, there's sort of six, 30 to 60% carbonate content in there. And then grays are siliciclastics backgrounds. Yeah, that's interesting, man. It's interesting correlation happening across the Bone Spring C2. And then what's inside that, what's essentially being trapped. So you're off having of that these structure. spaces where you have these organic rich, more or less, what is it? Or just organic rich shale? Is that what it's kind of inferring yeah, to? Yeah, it's organic rich siliciclastic. Okay, you know. that's that's above, that's mostly above the target though. Yeah. It shows you kind of like, you can see right in here where. You can see in some of these areas where you can define carbonate carbonate and then a nice siliciclastic yeah. high toc yeah. yeah so identifying carbonates is good because yeah. when you frack that you're going to get much more of a lateral frack when you're between the two carbonates yeah also Keeping drill time yeah. you know if you see a target um, trying to oh. avoid those carbonates save the drill yeah. time yeah i believe that 100 percent, man so that's an interesting uh interesting bounding target in the so, delaware basin so so looking at this just for funsies, we're going to go through a little exercise. <laughs> Let's do it. So we have these organic rich packages. We have these carbonates, like you were saying. We can frack out wide laterally, right? We can yep. get these large, is it Control lar the larger, larger half lengths horizontally, <coughs> opposed yeah. to vertically. But where is your ideal reservoir target, in Ooh. your opinion? Looking at oh, this, are geez. we looking at the are we looking at the clastics that potentially have that that porosity, space, that porosity, and that perm? That's the area that we're looking at. Okay. Sure. Right. Yeah, we also don't. I mean, we're hitting some of these faults obliquely, which are it's it's confusing when you look at this, trying to figure out structurally what's going on between the five wells. But man, okay, so I'm following it. Are you, you're confident that you can differentiate carbonate, calcareous mudstone, which is a carbonate that has clay-sized particles, and then a siliciclastic and an organic rich zone. That's awesome, man. Yeah, that's, that's incredible. That's badass, man. Okay, all right, let's get let's get it. So this is then mapping out that uh, carbonate unit in that first bone spring sandstone. Oh, uh, you can see the well location there. So the well had 51 feet. We mapped that out pretty well. Um, you can see this extend. So again, that's kind of this carbonate body is going to be important to us. We want to know where it is because it's going to affect that production from that interval because it's our completion so, are fractured. Okay. Right so up. this is uh, this is a carbonate body in the bone spring. S1, and we're looking at a scale on a map that says four miles by a mile and a half. Clearly, this package of carbonates trending in a obvious direction, right? It's some, you would say maybe 15, 20 degrees east of north, mm -hmm. something like that. 
and there's obviously a thickness thing and now we're talking about controlling our frack so we want to be underneath this this isn't the reservoir that we're looking at this is a nice frack barrier that we've mapped and it's trending in that direction and now what's what okay let's build do we go into the next interval what's underneath this or what do we do next uh, no so now this this is kind of the end of my introduction so this is really um it's just looking so that if we go back one slide parry pete up there we go. The real point of all this exercise is that's that's pretty complex geology really going on complex, in there. Yeah. And we I think as an industry we're recognizing that it's not just about engineering completion products. Right. It's understanding that geological heterogeneity. Yes. And the question Let's is how go. I want you to say it again, but like get on the mic and say it. <laughs> <laughs> it's not all about what? <laughs> that geological it's not about that comp engineering and completion um, factors. But it's about that geological heterogeneity. Let's go. Let's, Let's go. go. Let's go. The PB, okay. po PB podcast has spoken in the first presentation. We have spoken. <laughs> That's it. Not, next, not from next us. Slide. From Dr. Payne. Yeah, but Dr. Payne Dr. said Dr. it. Payne. We just endorse it. Exactly. Cool. Go. Yeah. Okay, motivation, success. Okay, let's move through. Let's, let's look at some more images. Here we go. Here we go. Motivation, well database, seismic. Okay. Now we have a pretty good idea where we are in the basin, Skimbo. Yeah, I like okay. that spot. That's a, that's a fun so spot. So those five wells, we're somewhere in between here. I got it. Okay, in the bone spring, though, that's really weird. Because what did you hang it on? Can you tell us what you hung that uh, that strat column on? So our stratigraph stratigraphy is all picked by the uh, Bureau of Economic Geology over Austin, Texas. So it's yeah. uh, Dave Carr and yeah. uh, Scott Hamlin. That's work. good stuff, yeah. dude. Right. Yeah, that's every, yeah, it's standard. I was thinking, like, did you hang it on like a, a big flat shale pick, and then pick those top, right? Like, and then put it back structurally, or did you? How did you hang your rock strat stratigraphically from bottom up or top down? It, as I say, the work was done by David Carr and Scott oh, okay. Hamlin. So right. I'm sorry, not to yeah. get sidetracked, but this is incredibly yeah. interesting. As some of the best wells by Devon, I think it was. Yeah. Yeah. What were those things? 5,000 barrels a day or something like that? 20,000 yeah. total barrels in a day? How do something you even, scary. How do something you even scary. physically fit that kind of fluid down a wellbore in 24 hours? <laughs> and they drilled two of them. They obviously can't repeat, otherwise we would see that data. <laughs> <laughs> but it's in the area. So you guys, are, you guys are flirting with a similar deal. You're flirting with a similar age rock and a similar reservoir. So this is cool. Yeah, so this is now just showing off that well database, our well tops picked by BG for us. That's the bone spring formation, moving on. It, when Parry's. Parry, next slide. That's the wolf camp, so we see, oh, we do cool. see a big stratigraphic change stepping up towards the northwest shelf. Huh. Okay. Um, we do get this, we've got a big structural fault, that's the red dash line. So That's a big fault right there? Yeah. I That's the trend idea of where we are, east, right? Yeah. <laughs> the old grammar ridge. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, this is our min mineral uh, fraction calculation. So we're we're calculating those mineral components you saw earlier, so clay content, and carbonate this is content. Okay. This is going to help you break out something geophysically. And this is this is looking at TOC. So we do yeah. a blend of oh, passive TOC. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So ba process. basically, here you're defining that. Okay. Inversion is going to work. We're going to be able to break out these different different things. Yeah, um, yeah. So this this is the sort of what is the mineralogy in the wells? What are the rocks in the wells? And then going one more slide. This is then looking at how yeah how do they relate to elastic yeah. properties? How can we like break them down? Seeing a relationship somewhat. So we can go with it. And this is how we build our facies model. So then that's that's our four facies to the the bone okay. spring and formation that you saw earlier. All that gr group of petrophysical data, that one, all the yeah. group of the colors comes back with a specific acoustic impedance. Got it. Yeah. Yep. All right, I'm following, I believe. And wolf cam, we get this nice velocity reversal that we see in the wolf cam. Um, so you can see here, it's uh, potentially there is an overpressure effect, but there's also a strong mineralogy effect. Oh, here, the so overpressure in the reservoir messes up geophysics data? <laughs> that's, a, that's a really good point. Yeah, it does. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It absolutely does. So you can find overpressure anomalies if you know your structural geology good enough. Yeah. And your geophysical properties, right? Well, we know, if you yeah. know if you know the bone spring like 
let's say, further up the shelf, sure. reacts one way geophysically, and then you're deeper in the basin, all as, of a sudden as it's lithology behaving. lithology changes. Yeah. So you got a lithology and pressure interesting anomalies in, in geophysics did. I didn't, real, I didn't think about pore pressure being able to, uh, to spit out a density anomaly in the geophysics data. That's, uh, okay, we got five minutes, man. This has been great so far. How do you want to wrap it up? It's your show, Simon. Yeah. Dr. Um, Payne. Yeah, if you head, head towards the end. Let's do it. Uh, let me, so that was a big this was some seismic calibration we did with the amplitude work. Holy smokes. We're going to see all that data tomorrow? This is going to be at your presentation tomorrow. Yeah. Gosh, oh. damn it. Why did we talk so much in the beginning? Who's, who's controlling me? <laughs> <Trying to get laughs> to All right. Well, let's... Okay. So let's not put words up. Let's put an image up. Just like a nice big image of the, the last, like, beautiful inversion. So this sends a carbonate debris flow down at the Wolf Camp level that we're picking out. Okay. But north... You're, you're, you're obviously... You don't say north is north of this page, but it is, right? That's it how is, everybody... It okay. is, yeah. yeah. So this is coming out of the San Simone Channel or the north northern shelf, or yeah, a massive okay. fault that's which controlling is, the platform and the northwest shelf. Yep, which it which is there, which is obviously there, but sediment's draping over the top of this now. Yeah, and we're pushing a bunch of sediment into the basement, our basin. So this is a, a carbonate debris flow. Yeah. Potentially, yes. Yeah, interesting. All right, this is the last image you want to show for the the whole thing. We got yep. we have data. Up and down the column, in between these carbonates, from Bone Spring to Wolf Camp, and you're and you're showing how we can map those uh, not both those anomalies in petrophysical and, and geophysical data, yep. combine it together and, and map map this. Okay, I'm uh, I'm really interested in your talk because uh, what an interesting play. This is considered a hybrid, right? The Bone Spring is not considered a self-sourcing rock. An un a true unconventional. A, tr a true unconventional. But it's got a bunch of organic shale in it. But it, it's obviously, yeah, it's, it's right? It's considered a hybrid. Mm -hmm. it's, it's conventionally migrated into this tight system from some other source. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. I think some people think of it as tight conventional. Yeah. yeah. Tight a lot conventional. of times people think of that, those bone spring sands as tight conventional. Tight conventional rock. Wow. Okay, man. That's... That's going to be really cool, Simon. Really cool. Um, we got anything for the completion? We're going to go to the next show. I think we're good, man. I think we. I think. Okay. Do, I think the doctor, P -Dog? the good doctor Payne. P dog gave has us a no good questions. Snapshot. <laughs> no questions for P dog. Okay. All right. Cool, man. Thank you, Simon. Yeah. That was awesome, dude. That was great presentation. Thank you.